lots of the lawyers have been very busy <laughs> reading uh, about new subjects of rights and uh, the, the, the trend towards making rivers and uh, nature subject, collective subjects of rights. Um, and certainly um, lots of the case studies that everybody has been looking at about not just mega projects, but um, about indigenous struggles around the indivisibility of nature, but also languages, uh, not just rights framing, languages uh, being one thing, but being many things, is what we will hopefully be talking about in this panel about the pluralization of uh, human rights, about legal pluralism and human rights, uh, and, the, and, the, and rights, how we might understand other ontologies in their articulations with uh, human rights. So I'm really delighted um, to be chairing this panel and to have been uh, able to play some small part in um, bringing my colleague Lisa Lot Vianney uh, to uh, Bergen. Uh, Lisa Lot and I have known each other for many, many years, and she has done some of the most uh, path-breaking work on indigenous ontologies and human rights, particularly on transitional justice, which was the first topic she worked on. And uh, as she's going to explain to us now, she's now uh, heading up a project on water rights and indigenous ontologies. Um, and the project is just starting, so it's a great moment to come to Bergen to share the project with you all um, and to hear comments from everybody. So um, Lisa Lott will speak for 20 minutes and then we're going to have a panel discussion and a possibility for everybody to ask uh, questions and make suggestions at this stage. So Lisa Lott, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, First of, all, first of all, I would like to um, express my gratitude to City and to CMI for this invitation. Um, as um, Rachel mentioned, um, recently, actually the 1st of May, this a huge new project started at the University of Carlos III de Madrid. And it will run for five years until the end of uh, April 2024. It's financed by the European Research Council. It's a starting grant. Um, and the past eight months, I've been really completely immersed in practicalities. Uh, and I was almost forgetting that I have a research project. So I was really happy to be here and to listen to all debates. And it was really nourishing. It was like a massage for my mind and for my body. Um, after, well, focusing on all the, all the setups. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's really great. And I feel that this project will, might uh, connect a couple of dots that have been raised during the, the last couple of days. Um, and what I'm going to present is actually um, based on, on my uh, presentation for the interview in Brussels. Uh, part of the selection procedure is an interview in Brussels that was uh, May last year. And I had uh, eight minutes to convince a panel of 18 international experts to give me one million and a half euros to implement this project. Um, now I have 20 minutes, so I have a bit more air time. Um, and one of the first things that I said in those eight minutes is that from childhood I am stuttering and I was pretty sure that during that uh, eight minutes and uh, um, 17 minutes after of question and answer, uh, people might hear it. Uh, this time I don't need to convince you to give me the money, but I'm a bit uh, intimidated by the very distinguished uh, public here, uh, knowing that there are a couple of... Um, international experts on the right to water, actually more than, than, than uh, I am. Um, at some point during the uh, question and answer of 17 minutes, I just said to the panel, look, this project will talk about the ele elephant in the room, uh, which is the concept of ontologies. Uh, Rachel already touched it in her uh, keynote speaker, and also Siri was, 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 was saying or mentioning um, that we need to challenge our uh, 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 categories. Um, so, yeah, 
that's the project actually uh, about. Uh, this is also a, a sneak preview for the for the logo um, that we have been developing the last months. Um, we didn't want to have blue in it, but here it's with blue, so it is what it is. Um, so. Um, I don't think that I need to give more explanation on those pictures, as we had already a long conversation about that. Uh, however, um, the thing is, as we all know, that uh, we're currently facing a huge water crisis, a climate crisis. Um, however, this Project Rivers uh, doesn't take for granted what water is and what it means. And River engaged with one of the most uh, challenging uh, of pressing questions of the century, to quote uh, Philippe de Scola, is the relationship between humans and nature. And well, on Tuesday we already discussed indigenous people rights and extractivism. This morning we had it on water. But I would like to stress that uh, worldwide indigenous peoples are not only mobilizing against the neoliberalization of water and nature, but moreover demonstrating radically different ways of knowing, being, and living in the world. Water is sacred, and it's becoming one of those bus slogans, but this project wants to understand what it really means that water is sacred. Just here, a very quick overview. Um, uh, rights to nature. Um, is entrenched in the Constitution of, of Ecuador in 2008, afterwards in Bolivia. In 2010, well, we had the whole morning already about uh, water turning into a basic human rights. But when I was drafting this project, um, that was in uh, 2017, uh, um, New Zealand, and then a couple of weeks later, India granted rights to rivers, which was like a new groundbreaking legal precedent. Um, and then came Colombia, well, like two months later, with uh, ruling on the river Atrato. Um, and when, and a couple of weeks before uh, having the interview in Brussels, uh, the Supreme Court of Colombia even granted rights to the Amazon. And um, regarding the, the ruling of the Ria Trato, uh, which is interesting, is that, let's see where I, yeah, that uh, they talk about the violation of the right to water as in Spanish is uh, Fuente Hidrica, which I guess in Spanish and English would be like uh, the spring source of, of the spring. So this is a very different interpretation of the human rights to water than that we have discussed so far. Um, so, um, granting rights to rivers is becoming an illegal hype to speak. And uh, Colombia is at the vanguard of this. Um, and it does actually remind me to the legal hype uh, within the transitional justice field. As uh, uh, Rachel uh, mentioned, I, I started my academic uh, research in the transitional justice field. And there was a legal hype to mobilize traditional justice systems in uh, dealing with the aftermath of human rights, the violations. Um, Against this background, the, the main research question of rivers is to what extent can international human rights law come to grips with pre-legal water realities? So my point is that from an orthodox legal perspective, the recognition as rivers, as legal entities, and the emerging human rights to water, well, are two different legal concepts. However, according to indigenous non-dualistic -du conception, everything is not only interdependent, but is alive. Meaning that nature, river, mountains, everything, should be equally protected as human life. I will come back to that in a minute. So the project, um, wants to create dialogues, empirical dialogues, with different bodies of literature. And this graph actually summarizes my academic career of the past, well, 15 years. And um, two weeks ago, I was with my team, so we are five in total, uh, on a transformative collaborative um, 
weekend, team, team building week in the mountains of, um, of, of Ulix and um, in the mountains of Spain with Ulix. And Ulix is a project that trains adults uh, working on social movements and social change on, um, on resilience and activism and so on. And uh, one of the tasks that they give us uh, was drawing a river and our life river to become to come to this project rivers so without words just with colors we had to draw our river and explain the different steps um, my river took a quite a long time to explain how i get here uh, I'm, I'm just going to focus on a couple of, of key moments but let's say that um, my my interest of my yeah, interest for indigenous people started when I, in my childhood when I was 12 years old and I read a uh, historical and fictional uh, book written by a Flemish author on the Mayan civilization and, uh, and the book ended actually with the armed conflict in Guatemala. Um, but I will move forward very quickly and start in 2006 when I started to do my PhD research on uh, within the literature framework, let's say, on human rights and cultural pluralism. But I was focusing on indigenous peoples, transitional justice and um, Guatemala. And actually, Rivers is conceived and born in, in Guatemala. And I'm really grateful to Rachel, who I receive as my comadre, because she has been following me and supporting me all, all the long way. And actually, when I, I wrote the first lines of the project, uh, that was in Guatemala, in Imla Hakok, when we both were doing a field research on water. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to have such a beautiful person uh, on my part and that lightens sometimes a really dark world that the academia can, can be. And um, some of you might have seen the video of, of Guatemala, of 500 years Guatemala. And um, well, then you probably know that working uh, in, about, and with Guatemala is an emotional roller coaster, and that has been like my, my past 20 years. So, um, actually, my PhD starting in 2006 was based on a master thesis in 2002, and my first trip was uh, to Guatemala was actually in 99. So what, what, what struck me in my, in my field research in Guatemala when, when I work with the Maya Kichi population um, to understand how they, how, they, how they understand justice, reparation, reconciliation, memory from their own perspective is um, that they say at some point, yeah, um, the Tzul Taka, the Tzul Taka is like the, the sacred mountain. Tzul is, is mountain, Taka is valle, is, is, is um, valley. Um, kyo Kyo lives, is alive. And I said, yeah, well, as a European trained anthropology, just an indigenous belief. Belief, it's like a fairy tale. It's, it's, it's their vision on the world and that's it. Um, however, during my research on, on the impact of the armed conflict, what, what, what came about was that um, they always came to the fact that also the, the sacred maize, corn, was, was burned down by, by the army and was crying and suffered um, because of the violations that happened. So the impact of the armed conflict for, him is, for them is a Nimla Rahilal, which is a great suffering, uh, which goes beyond then the individual suffering, goes beyond the collective suffering, and includes all the sentient beings, all the living beings that have been suffering because of the war. I was still caught up in that indigenous belief thing, but it, it kept me spinning and spinning and spinning. Um, and then I moved actually after my PhD towards the United Nations. I worked in Ecuador for during the office of the with, with the office of the High Commissioner, 
And uh, there I was confronted during almost three years with the huge question of how to ground human rights in a cultural, in a cultural diverse um, uh, society. And the theoretical proposal within that framework of human rights and cultural pluralism is through intercultural dialogue. Though that it's not that easy as it is proposed, not at all. We worked with the office on uh, supporting the draft law on the uh, coordination and cooperation between indigenous justice systems and, uh, and the ordinary justice system. We had many encounters also with support of uh, James and I, the then Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to talk with judges, to talk with policymakers. But it is extremely difficult if you have to explain that, for example, dreams are for many indigenous peoples extremely important in resolving cases. During that time in, in Ecuador, I, I was also uh, got in touch with the whole debates on decolonizing human rights and social science and, and, and civil society. And, and that resonated a lot with my previous work as, as in Colombia. Um, after after the UN, I was in. I was asked to write a, um, a report or to do research on the second biggest dam in Guatemala, the Shalala Dam. That, as you might have seen, the um, as a movie that the then president Otto Perez Molina was was imposing to Kekchi communities, actually in the same region where I did my previous research on transitional justice. So I went back after four years, just listening on, on, on how they uh, perceived that new threat in their lives. And what was, uh, for me, striking again is that they were talking about, again, on, on, on that Nimla Rahilal, that now it would not be with massacres, but with that huge hydroelectric dam on their river, that would be a new deep suffering not only for them as humans, but also for the river. Because the river is the mother, and the side rivers are the children. And the riverbanks, the fertile riverbanks, is the father. So that's an, a nucleo familiar. It's, it is a family, and building a dam on it, that's killing that family. Um, so it, it kept me spinning and spinning further and further. Then I was able to go back to the academia with the Marie Curie Research Fellowship, and I was able to uh, deepen more and connecting with uh, the, the framework of decolonizing human rights. Um, I worked further in Guatemala together with Rachel, then also with Colombia. Um, but then I came across the whole debates of the emerging paradigm of political ontology within uh, anthropological uh, 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 literature, which is actually part of the bigger ontological turn in social science, which is the work of Mario Blaser, Marisol La Cadena, Arturo Escobar. And that was so fun, yes. This is, this is what I'm trying to explain already 15 years ago, but I didn't have the theoretical frameworks or the tools to connect everything. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, that, that political ontology project is about the pluriverse, about relational ontologies, uh, controlled e e equivocation, uh, as Fivero de Castro says. It's not only about uh, epistemological blindness because of, coloni uh, of the colonity of power and knowing, but it's also ontological blindness. So, actually, rivers is like... Um, Peeling, peeling the onion uh, of cultural diversity turn in human rights, then the subaltern turn, then the post-colonial turn, then the decolonial turn, now we have uh, the ontological turn. So to win an ERC, you have to explain that it's, it's so-called groundbreaking approach. So we're going to work in the next five years in three contexts. Um, first is the UN system, then the domestic courts in Nepal and Colombia, and also on the grassroots indigenous communities in both countries. What, what is groundbreaking um, is that we're going to construct an ecology of legal water knowledges and practices, uh, and I put legal and water uh, between brackets because we don't take for granted what is legal and what is water. We would love to reconceptualize human rights to water from below and actually moving beyond the anthropocentric, anthropocentric human rights dogma and human rights. So uh, quickly, what is the research design? 
It is um, built in two research streams. The first stream is about indigenous visions and practices and to see water not only, to quote uh, Mar Marisol de la Cadena, as a natural resource and a human right, uh, which is built up in two work packages. And then the other research stream is about the United Nations human rights uh, system uh, towards encounter hegemonic water knowledge and knowledge production, which is also break down into work packages. And as you might see, it is a puzzle that needs to connect over the years. Um, I go just quickly through the different work packages and the main research questions. Um, so, Work package A, which we are going to conduct in Colombia and Nepal at the grassroots levels of communities threatened by dam project of mining. We haven't selected the case studies yet. That's the work that we're going to do in the next months. But uh, one of the questions are on how do water and rivers speak in the midst of social political conflicts uh, provoking by those uh, extractive industries. And here we would like to problematize the idea that un indigenous peoples are, as was mentioned a couple of days ago, uh, nature friendly. Is it like this? Uh, how? Why? Uh, there is a tendency to romanticize them now uh, as they have the solution to our climate uh, problems that we have. We will see. <laughs> The second work package is very connected with the lecture of, of, of Rachel. Um, and, and here we would like to, to delve into the question, to what extent can knowledge about water and rivers based, for example, fire uh, cer 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 ceremonies, uh, dreams, or even chants to waters, actually be heard in courts? And which strategies can anthropologists use to negotiate these radically different water realities with lawyers, human rights defenders, judges, who are all trained in an anthropocentric human rights paradigm that reduces, let's say, the, the whispers of the river just to merely beliefs. And the third work package and the second um, 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 research stream uh, engages with uh, international norm setting within key UN spaces, and Marta will be uh, leading that work package. So we're going to conduct empirical research during the sessions of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, also look closely to the work of, of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights. And the research question here are, how do people think in those international settings to water, and to what extent are these emerging uh, indigenous water conceptions and claims recognized and incorporated the next five years in the development and interpretation of this uh, human rights to water. And then the last work package um, will examine the impact and the limitations of the work of the experts mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples and the special rapporteur as knowledge slash ontological knowledge brokers. So, so what we are going to do in work package B at a domestic level in Colombia and Nepal, we would love to, to do empirical research with those indigenous leaders who have been opening up the, the, the path at the UN level and, and talk with them and understand that what, what have been their main obstacles, lessons, factors, and, and uh, success factors. So, um, thinking about the session of, of yesterday, so yes, it is a question-based research design. But at the same time, I'm an anthropologist. Um, I'm not sure if I could elaborate questions that we could reply with surveys or computer or whatever thing. So anyway, the methodology, uh, it's inductive, is legal and anthropological approach. It builds further on, on my work that I've been doing in, in Guatemala for so many years. It's multi-sided. Um, taking the decolonization of social science and human rights seriously. Uh, we want uh, to delve into, well, how can we create a participatory collaborative research? One of the uh, team members is an indigenous research, um, uh, is an, an indigenous PhD student, and she would love to contribute to the emerging literature on indigenous research methods. And yeah, the, the, met, uh, the methods were participant observation, um, 
focus group, entre comillas, interviews, uh, ethno-linguistic workshops, uh, delving into the language to understand the deeper layers of those significance and practices. Uh, of course, more traditional law, law uh, visions um, on doctrine and, and case studies, case law. And yeah, I just wanted to end with uh, sharing the, the team. So uh, clockwise, uh, Selcin is a Turkish anthropologist. She will work on the Nepali case, on the two work packages. Yeah, then me. Then Marta, um, who is half time the manager of the of the project, and half time she's gonna work at the UN with um, uh, regarding the right to water. In the middle, Digno is an um, is an associated uh, pre-doctoral researcher of my department. And uh, social science, who works on the inter-American court system and the right to environment. And then uh, Kelly, who is an indigenous NASA from Colombia, who will work in Colombia. And then at the end, Paulo, who is a uh, Colombian lawyer, um, but also a legal ethnographer. Okay, that's I would like to share with you. And as Rachel said in the beginning, as we are starting, I'm really um, uh, keen on, on hearing reflections, on, on hearing uh, recommendations, um, because it's going to be a very interesting uh, journey, I think. <laughs> and thanks again to Siri for opening up this space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lieselot. Um, can I ask the other panel members to come up, please? The, the modality we're going to adopt is five minutes from oh, yeah, yeah. each of the other panel uh, members um, who will introduce themselves for the, um, for the purposes uh, and for time. And then we will open up for comments and questions yes. from all of you. Um, so if I might start uh, with Marta, please. Hi. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for uh, for inviting us here. Uh, well, as you saw, I'm I'm part of the Rivers team. Um, my role is half time a project manager with these administrative procedures, which have kept us busy this month. <laughs> and then I will I will be um, focusing on this work package on the international norm uh, norm production norm and knowledge production. And yeah, as Lislo said, we two weeks ago we had um, a project team building and training week in the in the Mandes, which was amazing and and challenged the everything because we everyone just came to the project because we just started. So uh, uh, we did this exercise of the river. By the way, we did the the river of our life onto the river project by a river, <laughs> by the riverside. And that helped me a lot to, to know where I come from. Now we have, we, we are making a project that, that is about ontologies and with an anthropological uh, framework. So uh, you need to know where you are, where you come from. So doing this, this exercise helped me a lot to, to position myself. So, okay, this is, who I'm, who I am, to uh, what I bring, and these are my tributaries to my river. And I'm also ignorant of my ignorance, as Andes said. So, <laughs> so I think I will put um, tributaries in, in blank. That that well, I hope to find out, and and I hope to collaborate with my my colleagues to to make this triangulation of of the different scales at which we are looking at at how to upscale uh, these intercultural dialogues. And my challenge is yeah, uh, capturing the, how these conceptions of regarding water uh, are taken into account, not only uh, in the development, but also in the interpretation of the human rights, if they fit within the, the actual system, and, and, and also what is uh, up there in the in the common hegemonic knowledge, and what is not, and well, I I had very nice thoughts while in, in the previous 
table while you were talking about this development trade-offs. That's what I've been researching. I'm a water governance uh, well, scholar expert. I've been working on collective action for, for groundwater. I've been also, um, well, I, I lived in Bolivia because I felt attracted by all these human right to water movement. I was there in 2009 when the constitution was, was released, so, well, uh, I also did a, a study and followed the actors closely on how this reform was integrated into different scales. And I, I was also doing research on the field, so it was interesting to see this gap on what is going on at the international level. They were pushing for the, the, yeah, the integration of the human right to water in the United Nations. They had it in their constitution, they did reforms. And I was in the city, the, the vibe was quite different to the, of the city within this human right to water than to, the, to the, the Andean communities. For me, it was also a challenge because I was a total outsider and I learned a lot of a new world. So it was interesting to see this gap. And I think, uh, yeah, this is the, one of the main questions we have, how to bridge this gap or how to open the frontiers for different ways to relate to water into upper levels. And I hope we can discuss that with all the experts in the different fields we have here. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, Angela. Hello. Hello. So, hello everyone. I'm also very thankful of being here and I want to thank CMI for giving me the opportunity to speak, although uh, my topic lies a little bit in dialogue, but a little bit outside the scope of this discussion, which is, takes another level. Uh, to another level, the question of the question of ontologies. Um, I was really um, just to start uh, to shortly start. I, I am as I am doing my PhD in sociology at UCL Louvain in Belgium, and uh, just picking up on what you said uh, about uh, Colombia and Colombia being so um, uh, a ba at the vanguard of uh, these rights. Uh, my 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 research lies uh, at the same time we have so many uh, socio territorial and socio environmental conflicts happening at the moment in a post uh, a, a peace agreement uh, context uh, where uh, a lot of um, uh, issues and um, and um, yeah threats to environmental defenders, indigenous communities, and so on are happening. So this is the, a little bit the context. So very interesting to to see how that uh, how these uh, uh, researchers can bridge uh, can can show uh, these uh, these issues. Um, well, my question and what brings me uh, here is more, um, so I research uh, law in social, the use of law and rights in social movements, how um, the human rights discourse is shaping uh, also uh, political sub subjectivities around uh, uh, environment, around the uh, um, participation. I am looking at uh, um, uh, popular or uh, public consultations at sites of struggle around rights uh, to uh, to land territory territory and of course in the cases that I'm looking at at water although I'm not I'm not yet at that stage I'm still at the beginning uh, but um, uh, one of the first things is also uh, in these struggles the uh, the question of participation who gets to decide uh, uh, about uh, the decisions uh, who gets to decide where to uh, um, do a mining project or not like and, and how that might affect the living conditions of uh, the populations at hand. So my research, as I am Colombian and uh, interested in what's going on there, I am looking at two sites in Colombia, in Cajamarca, and at the northern part of the country at uh, Paramo de Santurban. 
uh, and the conflicts that have been going on there with successful and uh, successful uh, attempts at popular consulta consultations at, and drawbacks. So that's just uh, a little bit introduction, a little introduction to my to my topic, which resonates with what's been uh, with what's been discussed here, but also in previous uh, days. And I guess I will leave it at that for the moment. Also, any suggestions, any other questions? Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, Camila. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I am Camila Yanela. I am part also of researcher here at the Center on Law and Social Transformation and part of the, this project on the water rights at Bruce uh, Wilson is a director and many of us uh, sitting here, we are part. And um, yeah, so I think that, that the work that we have been doing in the, in the project on, on, the, on the right to water um, is also showing the, the challenges of research and defense in, in some context in where you have this indigenous population and, and um, so probably you, you can solve our problems <laughs> and that would be perfect. <laughs> um, so so for the, in the case of Peru that I have been making the, the study is that just to put an, an example. So we have the, the constitutional recognition of, of, the right to, of the right to water. We have some laws that go, the, the National Water Code that was uh, reformed and, and that was, a, uh, that was on, on 2010. But all the, the understanding of the management in, the, in that legal framework, in the, in the, in the, in the Water Code, that was, is the main legal framework, is about the management of the, of the water as a resource. Yeah? So the technology and, uh, and, 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 and everything is, uh, the, is the management of water as a resource and also define that the human consumption is, a, is the most important aim of, of, the, of the water, but it's as a resource. They, in the water code, there is a recognition of, of indigenous knowledge and, and technology, but for the management of water, uh, for agricultural reasons or, or that. But that is the understanding of, 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 of water on that. Mm -hmm. In a country that have some articles in the Constitution that, that recognize uh, indigenous people rights, that recognize that the yeah, right of, of identity, the right of, of culture, and, and that. So when we start to, to look for the cases with Carolina Neira, this is here, uh, we start to ask to, to, to some people and, okay, we, we, we address some of the politicians and we address some of the, of the, of the lawyers that are behind some of, some of the disputes, <coughs> and then come these, these cases. And there is one case that I, that I think is, can be relevant to the discussion here, is, is the case of the Hidrovia Amazonica. So the Hidrovia Amazonica is a case on the, on, uh, that uh, the Peruvian government decide that it's an Amazon waterway. So the Peruvian government decide that the four main uh, major rivers in Peru, that is the Amazon uh, River and, and three of the tributaries that are Marañón, Ucayal, and Guayaga, there has to be, uh, you, you have to create the, con the conditions to be safe to navigate through the whole year. And that implies that you have to make some things that to make it easy to navigate. Um, it has a, a prior informed consent uh, uh, process in 2015, but you didn't explain to the communities what was really about the project, and that you have to dig uh, and, uh, in, the, in the project, so uh, in, in the rivers, uh, because they identified certain points that it, there is no possible to navigate in the river. But there is no understanding on, on that uh, assessment and on that uh, process of what means the river for these communities that are living across the rivers. So when you speak with the people from the Amazon, the river is, is, is a lot of things. It's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a mother, uh, it's a, but it's also the place where the souls of the of the elderly, uh, when people die, go to the, to the river. They are living there. There is a, a, a world of people living in the river. So it is all the history, all, everything is, in, is part of the river. So if you make something to the river, you are destroying the past of, of, the, of the communities. Um, so what we do in that, in that circumstance? It's also the place that women go to have the babies. It's also a place that you go to heal. It's a place that means a lot of things, and you are going to 
make that place a highway. So, <laughs> and and but the but the people from the in the government they don't see like that. It's, it's a river. I mean, you, you you need to transport things, and 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 people also need to to use this for transportation. So and, um, so and 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 that is not framed as a right to water because for is is a resource. Is a is a hydro water way. So and as that is the thing that we have been have been really challenging for us when studying the case of Peru because there are some things that are like easier to understand like contamination, pollution, mining, and uh, and you are disputing for the for the source of water, the spring, and that. But this is more fluid in the in the site of the Amazon, and is the entity of the river has all their meanings, and uh, and you want the river to produce something to the to the yeah, this market approach that has to produce. So yeah. I will say that if you can answer that question, that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Solve my problem. Thank you, Camilla. Been <laughs> five years. <laughs> um, thank you to the panel. But before you, uh, before I open up um, to everybody for comments, and we have some time for that, just to say that I mean we've been talking. We had a whole day on methods yesterday, and uh, this is very much a mixed methods uh, audience. And this is a this is a research project that only ethnographic um, methods really can get at some of the. There are questions there, even though they're not kind of framed in the way uh, the rest of us might in other projects uh, frame the questions, and just flag up some of the issues that I think this very important project brings out. Um, the challenges of intercultural, interlegal translation, right? I mean, we talk about this. We use, a lot of us in the room do special expert witness reports. We're uh, looking at their importance in the cases and the challenges of doing them, the challenges of studying them as well are here, and they're a very important part of this. Um, uh, an, and an important aspect, the, the languages and the conceptualizations are obviously a, a fundamental part of uh, processes of socio-legal mobilization. And how do we actually get at that uh, methodologically? Uh, how do we challenge our frames that we bring to thinking about a particular topic? And these are not easy questions, and they require us to do our own rivers, um, which I really like as, as the methodology <laughs> that the team have been talking about. Um, when we think we see a thing, how do we know we're seeing the thing we think we're seeing? You know? um, um, if rivers are increasingly becoming legal subjects, as you have asked before, how can we hear them? What are they saying? Right? Who might translate them? <laughs> Who might speak for them? Um, and uh, I've just come back from Colombia uh, in, in discussions with the transitional justice uh, initiatives in, uh, of the HEP in Colombia. Uh, if territory is a victim of the armed conflict, which it has now been you know, deemed to be in Colombia, how might reparations for territory actually function? So these are um, terribly important legal uh, questions, political questions, ontological questions. Um, and if development discourses, as Namita was saying, trump rights discourses, you know, where might other discourses and other understandings come into these debates about uh, water in this instance, but I think territory more broadly. So um, I'm sure that the team will be really looking forward to your reactions and questions. So I open up the floor um, to all of you, please. Malcolm. <laughs> oh, sorry. Malcolm and then Eva. <laughs> sorry, Eva, I didn't see your hand. So, for the first, I want to really endorse what Rachel said. I think this is a question driven project. You spent the first half actually outlining the, the questions. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's a multi method project. I mean, you have different qualitative methods that you're, you're, you're trying to use. It doesn't have to be qualitative and quantitative. So, I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, project. And it's interesting reflecting on the last session because one of the things the committee struggled with was the cultural definition of water. So I pushed really hard to have it in. That was one of my uh, failures uh, uh, in the drafting because they had a very universal Western idea of domestic and household uses. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact, for example, in Africa, urban uses include, for example, kitchen gardening or, and, and livestock, and, and that's even in the Zimbabwe legislation. Mm -hmm. And then the committee really held on to a very... Uh, sort of technical view of that. So I think 
it's really important to think about, shall we take a p positivist approach in thinking about the diffusion of right to water and other water rights or a constructivist approach and say, and we see this across the world. At the moment these different human rights documents got adopted at the international level, they were appropriated by everybody. Mm -hmm. So the anti-privatisation movement says the human right to water bans privatisation. Yeah. The multinational corporation says it supports privatisation. The indigenous people yeah. say <laughs> it supports, you know, our claim. So, uh, the, these rights are fluid, uh, 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 literally, and so I think this project is really useful for helping us understand actually how rights in water are being understood and used by different groups. And so if I had two questions, um, the first is um, to what extent can different Actually, not only epistemologies here, but ontologies uh, <laughs> speak to each other. And it's, it's sort of where I ended yesterday. So I'm really curious to how you think about it, uh, both at a theoretical level, but in these sort of practical, in these conflicts. Um, I mean, I grew up in, in the island of Bougainville in Papua New Guinea, where people said, you know, it's the land that owns us. And, and so even though there was a compensation agreement for the mine, where I, which I live next to, in the end it fell apart because people were owned by the land. So mm -hmm. that's the first uh, uh, question. The second is, I was talking to our Zambian colleague last night about is it po how do you do decolonial academic work and how do you represent decolonial mentalities and practices? Should it only be through colonial or Western means, academic articles and, you know, manuscripts? Uh, and so you really, you're quite creative in this project. So how can and should this knowledge be represented? Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I'm going to take a few questions. So I have Eva and then Marta. Anybody else's hand? Eva. <laughs> yeah, actually my questions, question was also very much related to your second one. Um, as I understood your project in the very short amount of time you had to present it is that maybe the main goal is to serve as this kind of uh, interpretation, interpreters between ontologies and try to understand how this can be played out in, in practice. But I'm also very interested in the epistemological part um, because you touched upon it briefly um, that um, you're also looking into this uh, kind of way of producing knowledge, but I was interested in um, how you work on that um, in the process. And you mentioned you had a PhD student who is a NASA. Do you engage in in dialogues, epistemological dialogues, with, for example, uh, indigenous universities um, to be able to, yeah. Um, not only engage in participatory research, all of these more decolonial or feminist approaches to research, but also how do you yeah, uh, frame your research in, in, in this dialogue be between epistemologies? Thank you. Marta. Yeah, maybe I'm a little redundant, but uh, I'm not an anthropologist. That, so from the outside, I'd like you to expand a little bit more on what's the novelty, or like compare like what's new about the approach on political ontologies uh, related to cultural studies uh, and it seems to me from the outside that it brings uh, more uh, it, it puts more attention to the power relations and the, con the political conflicts that arise from the disputes between these different words or the different ontologies but uh, f uh, yeah, explain for an outsider, like r really, what make what's the difference of this new theoretical approach? Thank you. Lisa. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, no, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these challenging questions. Uh, I would say let's talk again in five years, but <laughs> that's a really cheap excuse. Um, as there were a couple of questions regarding yeah, how to do the decolonial the work. Um, start with yourself. I mean, f for me, the whole idea of be the change that you want to see in the world, um, which comes from Gandhi, is for me a very inspiring um, 
quote um, because well, I, I have been worked closely with a group that works on decol decolonizing framework, but unfortunately, I realized that it was mainly a discourse and little, little, little practice, actually the opposite, and I was so disgusted by it. <laughs> Then when I was, actually this, this project was written as a kind of a resistance um, of that period. And, and then I said, well, if I have so much money and I have so much time and I have <laughs> a couple of people with me who are in the same mindset, how, how we can do it? So it is, it is a process. I mean, it's, uh, and, and we starting with doing it by, by going to the mountains for a week and asking like ex external facilitators ha who, who work a lot with social movements on, on social uh, injustice to, to start thinking from how as, as group, as team, knowing that the academia is a highly in, in individualistic um, workspace that everyone wants to protect their territory um, at some point, but how, how, how can we transform that? And if we want to transform it, then we have to first have a discussion about it and, 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 and think how each of us would like to change it and, and making those critical parts based on our own rivers, how we can um, change certain, certain things. So. Uh, Project-wise, what is already uh, in in the project, um, the how we 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 have to discuss it is like, for example, uh, working with film and and video uh, in 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 Nepal and, and Colombia, a bit inspired by indigenous uh, filmmakers. Uh, so actually, giving direct voice to the people that they explain uh, those other practices, visions. Um, and so on as a way of participatory um, uh, research. Um, as I said, yeah, so one of our team members is indigenous and uh, she has been struggling with those questions because she is uh, trained as a sociologist in Colombia and she was extremely frustrated um, by the way that she was trained. So together with her, we would like to, to to delve further in, 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 in how, but that will be one of the main threads during the next five years, um, obviously. Um, at the same time, recognizing that we, we, we have to be careful of not falling in that maybe kind of a war is maybe a strong word, but that there is the truth of the indigenous and then our truth and our Western truth is completely wrong uh, because that might, might be a pitfall. Um, so my vision on that is really constructing that dialogue, uh, which is obviously not easy at all. I mean, the anthropologists in this public who have been working on those issues know because indeed the power, everything, the racism, deep, deep, deep racism to, to even recognize other kind of knowledges is present in, in everywhere. So when it comes to producing the indigenous knowledge, well, um, indeed, um, in Colombia, there are indigenous uni un universities with which whom we would love to collaborate and indeed uh, creating spaces where also indigenous people, academic or non-academic, but who are working on those issues can talk uh, and can go in dialogue with other researchers. Um, Regarding, yeah, um, epistemological, ontological, how to speak to each other. I mentioned it briefly, but there is a concept that we would like to, a tool that we would like to explore more, which is of Eduardo de Viveros de Castro, which is controlled uh, equivocation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, uh, during my work on transitional justice, what happened a lot, I mean, we sit together, we talk about justice, but actually we don't talk about justice because everyone talks about a completely different concept of what justice is, but we are not aware of it. So we, we just talk above each other. Um, and then to briefly uh, um, explain what the emerging, it is an emerging uh, paradigm or proposal of political ontology is. It's indeed, I mean, it, 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 it is, um, yeah, it is um, putting forward by several anthropologists who 
just like me, have been working with indigenous peoples for many, many years, mainly in Latin America, uh, on the extractive uh, issues, water mining and so on. And they, show, they saw the, the shortcomings of the of the framework of uh, political um, uh, ecology that focus a lot on power. But they say, uh, as, as I mentioned, it's not, it's not only, I mean, a mountain is not only a resource. Uh, it, is, it is also a living being for many indigenous peoples. And that not only part is not present in the political ecology, because as I showed you in this slide, all those um, discussions are still entrenched in the anthropocentric thinking that actually underlines all our Western thinking and practices of social science. So they want to move beyond that. Of course, the ontology question is not a new question either. Uh, certainly in philosophy, that, that, I mean, it has been mainly discussed. But now with all this empirical grounded uh, research and, and combining with the indigenous claims all over the world, it's like, from, okay, let's, let's take it now serious, but not falling into that kind of pitfalls from, yeah, it's impossible to talk to each other. So um, I don't know if, if that was a, an explanation. <laughs> um, we have three minutes, uh, and I have a question from Namita at the back. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? Gentlemen here, um, I'll take the two. And if we have some time to respond, you respond, and if not, over coffee. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was uh, such a fascinating project and panel. Uh, I was, uh, you know, thinking, uh, sort of pulling together different strands of thought from the various panels, the indigenous rights panel we had the previous day and the work that you're doing now. And uh, also connecting with what Rachel referred to my observation about the development discourse, trumping right discourse. And I just wanted to put it out on the table there that one of the, so I, I've worked on indigenous people's land rights and I have worked on water. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, this project is about indigenous people's rights to water, right? But, uh, you know, the way indigenous people look at, and, you know, Rachel, was very interesting what you said, that this is not just about rivers, it's also about territory. Uh, it's not just about the mountain, which is a living being, which was the issue in the famous Vedanta case in India. So the indigenous people have this holistic conception of the in environment, of the, re you know, the, the land, of the water, and so on. But we don't have that. And mm -hmm. the rights discourse is partly guilty of that because we have rights to food, rights to water, and rights to this. So the government's response often is that, you know, we want development. Development is a production of economic resources. So you push people off the land, move them into the cities, and then you supply them piped water. And that is satisfying the right to water. But the environment within which they're living in, the displacement, the dislocation, the, the complete sort of destruction of the whole, uh, the composite whole of which they were a part of, and now it's completely disrupted. So that is why perhaps development discourse, I mean, just thinking aloud, is how rights discourse is contributing to its own sort of end. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Narita. Yeah. Um, gentleman here. Sorry, I don't know your name. Eric. Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, or it's more maybe a, a comment uh, to, um, to, to the project. I think uh, it's a very fascinating uh, project. And um, I see the challenge of how can you convey the indigenous perspective. You, speak, you spoke about uh, voicing through movies and videos, but we, we often tend to produce things that, for, that are for a particular public mm -hmm. and with a particular perspective. There are trends in how to convey in an anthropological way or a Western way. Uh, through emotions, but I think you have a, a very nice uh, um, point of departure with the idea of uh, bringing uh, pe people from uh, f from the country where you work uh, that are working with dreams. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really fascinating to uh, convey this idea of the dream as a, a tool to bring us to them. I mean, because we tend to put what is emotional on the side. Mm -hmm. We are rational human beings. It's the West. So bring emotions through dreams, bring another perspective. Uh, I think it would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
Our time is up, I'm afraid. So um, can I uh, uh, ask you to carry on the discussion over a cup of tea or coffee outside and thank the panel very much and you as a, the audience for your contribution.